zach.hutchinson at audubon.org. Okay. Um, we have a newsletter uh, that goes out. So if you're in our region, especially, and, and you want to know kind of what's going on with bird conservation in our region, sign up for the newsletter. Okay. Um, about me. So uh, I'm a master bander. Uh, and while that is, you know, ripe for terrible double entendres, um, a master bander essentially is a federally permitted person uh, who handles and bans birds as part of monitoring and research, okay? And so for Audubon Rockies, I coordinate all of our bird banding efforts throughout the region. Um, and we banned, we banned hundreds of birds just within Wyoming every year, okay? Uh, and this particular picture is actually from me visiting Peru, teaching banding classes uh, across Peru. And I was pretty excited because I was getting my fingers torn up by this little parrotlet. So um, enough about me. You came here for the birds. So let's talk about the birds. Now this course, this class, I teach it all across the region. Okay. It's, it's not going to teach you how to identify every single bird. It's going to give you the foundation to build up that wide knowledge. And if you know some, some serious bird people, then you know, you know, they, they can identify birds just like that and that and that. So this course gives you that foundational knowledge that is essential to identifying birds on your own and using the tools that are out there, field guides, binoculars. This is going to lay that foundation, okay? You can't build a very good house without a pretty good foundation, okay? Um, and as we go through, I'll hopefully try to remember to uh, name the birds that are on the screen, but if I miss it, they're also going to be uh, labeled at the bottom of the photo somewhere, okay? So this is a black cap chickadee. All right, so you wanna be a bird nerd, what do you need? If you wanna be a serious bird nerd, there are recommendations out there as long as my arms on what you need to be a bird nerd, okay? People will tell you, you need good binoculars. You gotta have the most up-to-date Swarovski scope. You gotta have the best field guides, all of the checklists, the life list, the eBird, the bird song CDs, the software, blah, blah, blah. You don't need any of it to just enjoy birds. If you wanna be a true bird nerd, you might need some of that. But if you just want to enjoy birds, do some bird watching and identify some birds, uh, participate in community science efforts, you don't need that long list, okay? You need time, you need a lot of patience because birds, uh, birds can get you sometimes, especially the ones that don't like to sit still. So you need some time, some patience, and obviously you need birds, right? You, you can't identify a bird if you can't see it or hear it. So time, patience, and birds, those are the things you need. And of course, to have birds, we need the places they need. And that's what Audubon does. We protect birds in the places they need, okay? Now, if you wanna add on to that, if you wanna extend a little bit beyond that, maybe not bird nerd level, but just a little bit beyond that, binoculars and field guides are not critical, but essential uh, to furthering to that next step of learning bird identification, okay? And we're gonna go through all of my recommendations. Now, again, these are personal recommendations. Uh, just from me, from teaching classes, getting everyone on the same uh, level when I'm teaching, these are some of the recommendations I make, okay? Not everyone's going to agree with these, and that's fine. Find what works for you, okay? All right, um, so binoculars, optics, all right? If you're going to get them, and again, you don't have to have binoculars to enjoy birds. I had red-winged blackbirds on my bird feeders all day. They're about 15 feet away from my window. I didn't I didn't have binoculars all day, and I still enjoyed all of these red-winged blackbirds coming in, okay? So you don't need them, but if you are going to get binoculars, um, those numbers can be confusing as to what they mean. And then when you see the price tags on some of them and you don't know how good of binoculars do I need, I'm gonna go over that real quick um, because this is part of learning birds is learning your gear as well. So we're gonna go through the gear part and the birds are coming, the birds are coming. Okay, so the first number, all right, if you see a pair of binoculars that are 8 by 42, they're listed that on the box. The first number is the magnification, okay? And the larger that number is, is how many times closer the object appears to your eye, okay? So the first number is the magnification. Now, 
you don't need 50 by 200 binoculars. That would be way too big. And of course, I, my arms couldn't hold them up for very long, especially looking at warblers. You don't need massive binoculars, okay? You don't need extreme magnification. So generally, I recommend eight magnification to people who are just getting started. Um, if, if you've got the arms for it, you might bump up to 10. But every bit of magnification, every little shake you have, it's magnified as well. So if, if you have a little bit of shake in your hands and arms, maybe you bump down to six by something, okay? So I recommend eight by 42 to start off with or eight by 32 for some folks if they want lighter binoculars, okay? Now that second number, that second number is the front lens diameter, okay? And what it does is it's the light allowance that comes through your binoculars. So the bigger that number is, the larger that number is, the more light can pass through, okay? Then that, that brightens what you're seeing in the field. So if it's a cloudy day, a larger uh, front lens diameter can brighten what you're seeing, okay? So it can be a critical number, but again, the larger that number is, the heavier your binoculars will be. So the happy medium, eight by 42, is often recommended to people who are just getting into birds, okay? And again, if you wanna go down to eight by 32, or six by 32, or any range in there, find what works for you. And make sure you try them out if you can. Now, obviously right now, this is not the time necessarily to be visiting stores, um, but you know, uh, if you have the opportunity in the future to test some out, test them out before you can buy them. There are some companies who will even send them for testing where you can, you can try them out. And if you don't like them, you usually just have to pay shipping to return them back, okay? Now, you don't need binoculars that cost a lot of money, okay? Um, if, if you want the medium range, uh, my personal recommendation maybe is looking into the, the Nikon lines, but even still, you don't need binoculars that cost that much. Celestron makes a great binocular, eight by 42 for $60. It's high quality glass and they're well-made. Um, and if you want an entry level binocular, just to see if you're interested in, in taking this further, perfect, okay? Try out those, those Celestrons. Um, they have a wide variety. And again, they, they keep the price low, okay? Um, if you're gonna go into scopes, scopes are essential for seeing distant birds like shorebirds, wading birds, ducks, um, birds that are gonna be a long ways away that binoculars just can't reach. But again, only get a scope if it's within your budget. You can enjoy birds without a scope, okay? Um, and, and there's a lot of pieces to a scope. I'm in Wyoming. I had to have a heavy duty tripod for my scope because throughout much of the year, sustained winds of 30 miles an hour are pretty regular. So I had to have a, a heavy tripod and you have to consider all those things when you're making these purchases. So if it's not within your budget, then stick with what is and enjoy the birds you know, that you can, okay? And guess what? Bird watching, there's so many people out there who have this gear that if you come across them while bird watching, especially you know, when, when things are, are uh, in a safer place, then maybe they'll let you share their scope. Okay, you don't have to have the top notch gear to really enjoy and love birds. Okay, all right, field guides. So, when people are starting out, if you want a hard, something you can touch field guide, I recommend the Sibley Guide to Birds. It's great for those who are new to birding. Everyone has their own personal choice. Okay, but I recommend Sibley just because. Drawings when first learning birds can be helpful because if you, if you buy a guide that's uh, more photo based, photos can be difficult depending on how good the lighting was, um, you know, how, what angles did they capture. What drawings and paintings can do is capture a bird how you would see it in great light and from correct angles. Okay, so that's why I recommend Sibley. You don't necessarily have to get a Sibley. I'm just offering a personal recommendation. If you don't know which one to get, Sibley's a great place to start, okay? Um, but if you don't wanna buy a guide, there are so many apps available for those who love birds, okay? There's the Audubon app, which is a free app. So if you have a smartphone, you can go to the Google Play Store or um, Apple Store and download the Audubon app for free. 
it will help you identify birds. It has a field guide within it. Um, and it has all of these amazing resources attached to it. There's also Merlin, um, which is from Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And it, it does some of the same things. And then it also plugs into eBird data and shows you how likely a species is to be at your location at your time of year, okay? And you can see that uh, on the slide there, it shows you um, the, the occurrence across, across the year for the species that, uh, that got captured in that, that image, okay? If you love raptors, there's just a raptor ID app. Um, and it's, it's an amazing piece of work. And so it's free. Again, it's free. All of these apps that are up here are free. And eBird is a great community science project that allows you to capture your sightings to help track for yourself, but also then to help contribute to ongoing, uh, ongoing monitoring for birds, bird populations worldwide, okay? Social media. Again, I'm, I'm loading you up with resources. I hope you're writing down or you're gonna come back and watch this because I'm loading you up with resources. And that's never a bad thing, especially when they're free, like social media. So if you have Facebook, there's a group called What's This Bird? All right, it will help you to identify birds and they can often even help you learn how to identify the bird you're posting about. They all have specific rules, so make sure you read the rules. There's just a Raptor ID group, okay? There's a group for just ducks, which I love the name, duck, duck, goose, waterfowl identification. Yes, please, more funny bird names, okay? There's one for sparrows. A lot of people don't like identifying sparrows and I understand that. And there's a group just for that, okay? There's websites out there, all right? There's all about birds. There's birds in North America. Audubon has a free online guide using David Sibley's paintings and Ken Kaufman's information, okay? And then eBird has the app as well as the online resource, and it's rolling out uh, a resource guide, an online guide as well. So, so many resources. If your mind's about to explode, trust me, I understand. It's a lot, okay? So filter through them over time. This is not a race. It's not a sprint, okay? This is something to take your time on. It's like a lazy river. Just let bird watching take you where it's gonna take you, okay? And use these resources as you find appropriate, okay? Um, if you wanna learn bird songs, um, there's, there's CDs out there, obviously, but then there's, uh, there's websites, Larkwire, Bird Academy, and then National Audubon Society, has birding by ear, okay? And you can find that uh, through the Audubon website. So resources out there to help you learn the audio part of bird identification, which is a critical, critical piece, okay? Now, all those resources are helpful. However, when you think about the fact that there are 10,000 plus species in the world, how hard would it be to memorize every little piece of all 10,000 species. And then you have to remember, there's differences between males, females, juveniles, immature, seasonal plumage changes, definitive plumage changes, genetic mutations, and hybrids. It's a lot of little pieces. And that's why a foundation is critical, okay? Without the foundation, there are few people who could memorize all of the little differences between all 10,000 species, males, females, juveniles, etc. okay? So, lay the foundation so that let's say maybe you do travel to a new state or a new country or a new province, okay? If you do that, the foundation gives you then the knowledge you need to use a new field guide in a new place, okay? When I went to Peru, I, I, I couldn't identify all the birds of Peru. It's not like I could memorize them, right? But I used the foundation that I had been taught to then use the field guide, use the resources that were available and identify birds as I went, okay? So don't be overwhelmed. Take it little by little and use the foundation we're laying right now, okay? All right, remember, we're sitting here. Make sure to stretch, make sure to stand up, all right? I can't see most of you, so if you wanna dance, maybe do a little dance, okay? Do something, just remember not to sit because this, this is gonna go for a little bit longer, all right? And by a little bit, I mean we're we're, we're scheduled to go uh, for another 40 minutes or so. So take time to stretch as I'm going through this, okay? Um, and if you have questions, make sure to throw them in the chat box and we will be getting to questions uh, towards the end, okay? We'll make sure to take a Q&A timeout. And again, if, if I see some as I'm going through this, I'll try to get to them, but definitely 
you're welcome to throw your questions in the chat box, okay? Um, and stretch like that trumpeter swan is doing right there, okay? Get in a good stretch like that. Oh, it's, it's one of my favorite photos right there. Um, okay, bird basics, bird identification basics. I'm gonna correct myself. It's, it's not a step, step, step kind of a thing because when you are observing a bird, and I mean you're observing it visually or you can hear it, okay? When you're observing a bird, there are a lot of pieces that are interconnected and they create a web. And that's what you're seeing. This is, this is my bird identification web. Everything relates to the other pieces of the web, okay? So if you see a bird, also make sure to listen for it, okay? So you're connecting the visible and the audible. But don't forget where you are, when you are, okay? And uh, what habitat? And what, what, what behaviors was it exhibiting? All of those things are connected and, and we're going to go into each of those in depth as part of this, okay? So there's three parts. There's three basic parts to that data identification and this is our foundation. What's visible, what's audible, and what is my context? So when, when you see a bird, those are the thoughts that should lead then to more questions, okay? Or to observations, all right? So that is our basic bird identification web. What's visible, what's audible, and what is my context, okay? All right. So you see a bird. Um, another, another way that uh, you'll, you'll hear birders talk about when you see a bird is, and maybe they won't refer to it as the ID web, they'll say use GIS or JIS, you'll hear it called both, okay? It's actually uh, a term that originates from World War II pilots, which means general impression of size and shape. But those are just a few pieces of the overall, the pie, right? I mean, you, everyone likes a good pie. So these are just a few pieces of the pie that make up that beautiful life bird pie, okay? So you, if you hear this term, that's what they're talking about, bringing everything together, okay? Now it's referring specifically to size and shape. And without me telling you a thing about this, this silhouette that's just a standard graphic um, that comes through, you know, whatever presentation uh, tool I'm using, most of you can probably tell that's a goose, right? Some sort of waterfowl, probably a goose, okay? You just use GIS, even if you never heard the term before and you identify that bird when it came up as some type of goose, you used it because you already have a lot of knowledge and maybe you just aren't recognizing it right off the bat, okay? So you have the knowledge, you were able to apply it to that goose or goose-like bird, okay? So you take the web and I call this the rainbow stairway to bird heaven, which is identifying a really tough bird, all right? When you get to the point where you can identify exhibitors from just their silhouette, that is the peak of bird identification, okay? And so these are the steps. And again, these all relate to the bird web. What's visible, what's audible, what's the context, okay? So shape and then size, field markings. Did it make a sound? Where is it at? What's the habitat? What's it doing? All of these, if you can capture information from each one of those, you will get to bird identification peak, okay? So much faster, okay? So consider these. This is that foundation, okay? We go from the web, which is very broad, to specific steps from the web, okay? Or a specific walkway from the web. And sometimes you won't get certain parts of these, but get as much information as you can, okay? It's critical. So if we start with something like shape, okay? Which was our first, our first step there on the, the rainbow walkway. You may not be able to identify all these to species, but some of them you might, okay? Um, you, you can at least maybe tell me, hey, you know, well, there's, there's that, that weird goose again, right? Um, maybe that bird over there that's in the, the cattails, some sort of heron or egret, okay? That's using the shape to narrow down your identification, okay? Bird families generally share similar features. So what you're doing when you start to narrow them down 
by just shape, you're already sorting using your brain, you're sorting into families. Hey, that, that's a goose. So that's in the, the waterfowl, right? That's uh, in the duck and goose family, okay? Um, or the, the heron or egret bird, right? That's into that family. Maybe you can tell that's a hawk on the, on the top left, right? So you narrow that one down. You can do so much more already than I think sometimes we give ourselves credit for, okay? Because you know a lot of these basic shapes, all right? That middle bird, that's a, that's a bird that uh, very obvious in the southern parts of the United States, uh, a scissor tail flycatcher. Um, again, you could just tell what that bird is if you've, if you've seen it before, especially just from that shape because it has a distinct shape. Most birds have a somewhat distinct shape, okay? Or at least the families do. Just like uh, then you see the black skimmer down there in the bottom right. Okay, now if you apply it to actual photos, these birds are both birds that uh, spend time in the, uh, in the northern parts of North America and then winter, um, you know, down into uh, the central parts of North America, okay? And while they have similar behavior sometimes and share similar habitats, they have very distinct shapes, okay? In fact, most owls versus hawks are gonna have distinct shapes. Owls, you can see it has that, that broad neck from all those feathers. If you saw an owl without the feathers, looks very different, but because of its feathers, its shape is that more bulky cowled look, okay? Versus a hawk, which has that more restricted area around the neck and a smaller head appearance. And again, it's because of the feathers, okay? So just shape, even if you can't tell me what species each of these are, most of you could have probably told me one's an owl, one's a hawk, just from shape, okay? So again, these are those pieces you need. And a lot of you know this already, okay? We go from shape to size. And we teach people use common birds as reference points for size. Birds that just about everyone in North America knows. House sparrow. I, I can hear house sparrows outside my house right now fighting over sunflower seed, okay? American robin. Most of us We'll see these at some point during the year, okay? An American crow, very widespread across most of North America. Use these three as your comparison points, okay? Thinking of the house sparrow as a smaller bird, so is it larger or smaller than a house sparrow? And the American robin as your medium-sized bird, okay? Is it larger or smaller than that? And then your crow, is it larger or smaller than that? Now, I have a trick that if you use a fairly standard field guide, Okay, so if you have a fairly standard field guide like Sibley, I have a trick, okay? Everything, just about, just about everything that's larger than a crow is in the front third of your book. Everything that's about crow to robin size with a few exceptions, looking at you hummingbirds, yeah, all right? But everything that's about crow to robin size, middle third of your book. And everything that's robin to sparrow size or smaller, again, except for a few exceptions, are gonna to be towards the back third of your field guide, okay? So your field guides are sorted taxonomically, but luckily, larger birds are placed in the front of the book, thanks to taxonomy, okay? And smaller birds generally tend to be towards the back. So if you have a standard field guide and you can use these general uh, reference points of common birds, you can apply it then, hey, that's larger than a crow, I'm gonna have to start towards the front of my field guide, right? Pretty easy. And there's another thing you can do with your field guide and that's tab it. Put tabs in your field guide. You can see I got that, that little tab there just as an example. Tab your field guide, tab families for quick reference, okay? If you have the tools, use them. And then if you're using an app, apps have amazing features that allow you to sort um, by taxonomy, by name, um, some let you sort in other ways. So use the tools you have and learn the tools you have, okay? So use a bird size um, and then you can consider birds that fit in around them, okay? So a, an American goldfinch is gonna be smaller than a house sparrow. An evening grosbeak is gonna be smaller than a robin, but larger than a house sparrow. A blue jay is gonna be larger than a robin, smaller than a, a crow, okay? So 
consider where birds you see commonly or birds you're trying to learn fit into that puzzle of size, okay? And you know, you go back to our goose, goose gonna be larger than a crow. So think of all that as you're going through this. Again, and return to your spider web, gain as much information as you can, shape and then size. And then we get into field marks, all right? Like this wonderful lark sparrow, which lark sparrows have amazing facial field marks, which make them a delight to look at and a delight to use to teach because they've got all of your standard facial field marks, okay? Um, so if you have a field guide or if you take some of the, uh, the uh, uh, online, the, the apps or some of the online field guides, they provide uh, resources for learning field marks. You'll hear bird people use field mark terms a lot. It's good to learn them. So if, if you have a, a field guide, a hard field guide, something you can actually hold in your hand that's not related to a smartphone, all right, the first usually 10 to 30 pages-ish are going to teach you what field marks are, what they're called, and then they're going to teach you how to use that field guide, okay? So in this case, uh, a few terms you might see in your field guide are crown, and in the case of the lark sparrow, it has a white crown stripe with rufous and black adjacent crown stripes, okay? The supercilium, which is kind of like the eyebrow looking area, it's white, okay? The, the mailer, and you'll hear other terms like mustachial area, submustachial, submailer, supermailer. You'll hear a lot of those terms, okay? But generally, it's just called the mailer region. It's white, bordered in black. It's got a white chest or a black chest spot on a white chest or white breast, okay? The nape is grayish or brownish gray, all right? You'll see these terms. So it's critical to learn them when using your field guide because if you don't know what the field guide is referring to, then you can't identify it as quickly, okay? So learn the first parts of your field guide, which include learning all the field marks of the various types of birds, all right? Sound. Most of you know a lot of sounds already, all right? Everyone probably knows the sound uh, that this bird makes, right? Maybe you don't know any other bird sounds, but just about everybody knows the sound a turkey makes, okay? And even if you can't identify it, it can help you find the bird, use it to locate the bird to then visually work on identification. And then your brain can connect what's visible and what's audible together, okay? Maybe you never get to see the bird. Maybe you only hear it. Then you need to connect what's audible and your context together, okay? Again, using your web. Remember all of that, okay? So if you're at home and you know what a turkey sounds like, go ahead and sound off, make your turkey sounds. I'll give you a second. Yep. Yeah, those are some pretty good turkey sounds, I think. Sounds like good turkey sounds. Um, if you don't know what a turkey sounds like, the hens make a very loud tuck, tuck, tuck sound. And then the males, when they're strutting, all right, their territorial is a it's part of their, their strutting, you know, showing off for females and uh, attracting mates and defending territories. Okay. All right. There are devices out there called mnemonic devices that allow you to maybe trick yourself into learning bird sounds that are difficult, okay? Um, and a lot of these you might recognize. Caw, caw, caw. Everyone knows caw, 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 right? And if you don't, it's okay. You're gonna learn what it means, all right? Uh, the house wren makes a sound that I just, it sounds like a jumble of notes and someone who just stubbed their toe to me. Um, Chickadee dee dee. A lot of people know the chickadee sound, okay? Um, and so use these devices to help you learn bird sounds, okay? Um, so if like, if the American crow and the common raven, if those two sounds sound similar to you, you're gonna have to find a way to teach yourself how to recognize them. Um, so for me, the crow sounds like it's saying caw, 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 but then the raven sounds like it has a sore throat or it's coughing, okay? Eh, 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 kind of a sound, okay? And then you add in fish crow. Fish crow sounds like a nasally crow. <coughs> so trick yourself into learning these, all right? And sounds are, are very important, very important. Don't ignore the sounds when learning birds. Learn their sounds as well, okay? Um, so here's, here's just seven 
uh, mnemonic devices for these particular seven species um, that, that you can write down and use. And again, this will be recorded and you can grab it later if you'd like, okay? Um, but just find ways to help yourself learn bird sound. And most field guides also will give you some, some devices as well to remember these, okay? Um, one of my favorites to, to teach to, to uh, school groups when I'm working with school groups is the American goldfinch. It, uh, it looks kind of like a potato chip when it's in breeding plumage, that bright yellow, and then it flies kind of in the shape of a potato chip. And as it flies, it says, potato chip, potato chip, okay? So that's, that's one that I, uh, I'll, I'll teach to, to school children when I'm working with them. Um, the mountain chickadee, for those of us living in the West, uh, sounds like it says cheeseburger. So a lot of people around here call it the cheeseburger bird. It sounds like it says cheeseburger. So use these little, little, little tricks, okay? There's no one who can tell you how you have to learn birds. Use tricks that help you learn them, okay? All right, now we're into context. We covered what's visible, what's audible. Now we're into context. Where do birds occur? Think of habitat. What are their needs? Birds need food, water, cover, okay? Some birds, they spend a lot of time in the air. Some birds flock together, others don't, all right? Consider all elements within your context, okay? Um, and when you're considering, you know, habitat. Let's say you just wanna know where to go birding. Think of the things birds need, okay? If you wanna find a certain bird, find out what it needs and that will help you find it, okay? So look in these places of need and or comfort. Now this, uh, this wonderful sagebrush and uh, short mixed grass prairie here, um, you're gonna find grassland birds and sagebrush uh, species in this area, okay? A lot of things maybe like lark buntings are gonna be in this, in this area, okay? So again, learn the pieces of, of, of context for certain birds, you know, what, what does this family of birds, where do you typically find them? Grassland species are gonna be near grassland. Waterfowl, you're gonna find around water, right? Typically, okay? So learn those things as part of your growing process for bird identification, okay? Think about some obvious things. You're not going to find a pair of common golden eye, uh, you know, showing off and displaying out in the middle of, of a saguaro desert. And if you do, call me because I want to see it, okay? Um, although this year, there was a pair of bald eagles nesting in a, in a large saguaro. So there are unusual circumstances occasionally where birds will show up in places they're not expected. But typically, you're not gonna find a pair of diving ducks in the middle of a desert, okay? Where would you find some ducks? In a wetland habitat, okay? So consider that, like these hooded merganser, are, especially in their breeding season, where are you gonna find them? In places where uh, they can properly and safely raise chicks, okay? What about your bird feeder? Think about the common birds that you experience at a bird feeder, okay? Um, you typically aren't going to find a trumpeter swan at your bird feeder. And if you do, take a picture and submit it to the Audubon Photography Contest because uh, that's, uh, that's something everyone wants to see, okay? So think of the common birds that come to your feeder. So when you see birds at your feeder and you're trying to identify them, you know which area of your book you need to be going to. Finches are one of the most common feeder birds. Finches and certain species of sparrow. So you're gonna be at the back of your book for a lot of your feeder birds, okay? consider all that, like evening grosbeaks. In some places, they're very common feeder birds, okay? American goldfinches, which are there on, uh, on the other photo. Um, think about your common feeder birds, okay? Your bird feeder, it is still uh, something that you need to consider contextually, because there are some birds that just won't come to feeders, okay? They just, they just typically don't come to feeders. Um, you're not, gonna find, uh, you're not gonna find snow buntings and Lapland longspurs at feeders typically, right? Where are you gonna find them? Snow-covered uh, snow fields out in the middle of uh, wide open spaces, okay? Context, think of your context and use it because you can eliminate so many species just from learning context, okay? Where are you gonna find tree sparrows? Near brushy habitat, uh, oftentimes where there's, there's also uh, some nice riparian habitat with you know brushy weedy areas maybe a few trees okay where are you going to find red crossbills 
crossbills pretty much depend on pine uh, pine cones. So you need to find conifer trees that have a, a good crop of cone, okay? Great way. All right, now another piece of context is behavior. So many birds are distinct in their behaviors. Think of woodpeckers. Everyone knows what woodpeckers do. They climb up trees, sometimes down trees, but still facing up, right, right? And they peck on things. Woodpeckers have a distinct behavior, okay? So recognizing distinct behaviors, or if you see a bird, you don't know what it is, and you're taking notes about your observation, make sure to take down what behavior was it exhibiting? What was it doing? It's critical. I mean, if a bird is pecking, hey, that's a piece of information you're gonna wanna know when you try to identify it in your field guide, okay? So consider birds, some birds, they feed or forage in a certain way. They fly in a certain way. Some birds give crazy displays like turkeys or sage grouse or prairie chickens. Consider all of these behaviors, okay? It's an important part of context. And a lot of times, a very distinct behavior can help you find an identification that much faster. I mean, just, just lickety split, you'll have that identification, okay? Um, birds that, that creep up or down a tree. Nuthatches can go up or down a, a tree, whereas brown creepers typically only go up a tree. Very distinct behaviors. So if you see a bird going down a tree, head, you know, head pointed down, probably not a brown creeper because brown creepers only go up the tree, okay? So all critical pieces. Um, warblers, warblers are known for not sitting still, just constantly flitting around, picking insects off of leaves, you know, they're gleaning insects and, or they're fly catching insects out in the air. So warblers are the birds, rarely do they sit still, okay? Um, and they're some of the most sought after birds. And as you can see from these photos, there's a reason. They are colorful, they are gorgeous, okay? They're beautiful singers um, and, uh, and they are constantly uh, moving. So they often are easy to find initially, but then hard to keep track of after you've seen them, okay? Um, other birds with distinct behaviors, raptors, all right? Diurnal raptors, hawks, eagles, they're often found soaring, okay? Wings wide open, soaring across an open space. That's a distinct behavior, okay? There are, there are birds that, uh, that you just don't see soar like that, where they'll, they'll ride thermals to get height, you know, they'll climb higher without flapping, okay? Um, you don't see that in a lot of species. So that's a, that's a distinct behavior, okay? And your field guide will talk about distinct behaviors that are useful to identification, okay? Now, if, if you think about it, your brain is like a computer, okay? And let's say you're, you're trying to find, maybe you're in an online store and you're trying to find a product and you apply filters to help narrow down your results, okay? That is what this is. Your brain is applying filters through what's visible, what's audible, and what's your context. And this is just a, a drawing with bird silhouettes. And yet, there's a lot of visible clues and there's a lot of contextual clues. Now, it's hard right now for the audible. I can make some bird sounds, but uh, I'll save you from that. Use what's visible right now. Use, you know, what you can see, but then also take into, uh, into your brain the context and you'll start filtering out certain things, okay? So think of your brain like that computer, you know, that program that filters out results to help narrow down so you can find your product faster. That's what your brain is doing for identifying birds, okay? Um, so uh, let's, let's, let's jump in here. Uh, there's a bird down in some cattails, okay? Now we can see the shape of the bird. We can see the size of the bird as it relates to the cattails. We also have context. Notice I said cattails. Well, that's a pretty distinct habitat type, right? Okay, there we go. We can narrow that down into herons and egrets, wading birds, okay? It's larger than some cattails that uh, look pretty mature. So it's gonna be probably a larger heron or egret and there's only, there's only a couple species that are that large um, and we can narrow it down. Uh, there's a bird sitting on a dead branch and uh, you can see some, some little horn looking things, okay? And while they're not actually horns, 
they're still useful and it's where the bird gets its name you know with the great horned owl showing off its plumicorns okay um uh how about over on that tree uh, i see something over on on the tree there it looks like a, a bird that's uh working its way up the tree like a, a woodpecker okay context it's, it's showing a behavior and a shape and a size because then you look left of it and on those three little uh thick short trees that that provide good thick cover there's a, a bird that's smaller with a nice tall crest on its head and it's sitting in a prominent place probably singing like a cardinal would okay and you can see the woodpecker on the trees larger than the cardinal so you get shape size and context just from that black and white silhouette okay um birds on the wire context those there's four birds on that wire in a flock not all birds flock like that okay a common species in north america that is frequently found in larger flocks is the european starling okay an invasive species but one that you still need to learn identification for because you're going to experience it so it's in a large flock hey that helps you is it a bird that's typically found in a flock yes or no okay consider that just like the big soaring beauty oh right there some sort of hawk okay uh, there's that scissor tail fly catcher again um, normally if this were in person if I were able to see you and talk to you I'd make I'd make all of you guess these I make you a shout out guesses at you know what these silhouettes are but a little harder right now so I, I can't hear you shouting out but if you want to yell at your computer you yell at your computer I'm not gonna stop you yell as much as you want especially you know maybe you're a sports fan you miss yelling at your TV for sports then yell at the computer about what birds you're seeing ha American crow Ah, ring neck pheasant. Ah, American robin. You know, really get into it. No reason you can't be excited about birds. Did, did I sell it? I sold it. Yeah, all right. Okay, when you see a bird, think of your web, okay? What's visible, what's audible, what's your context? Think of your staircase, okay? So, let's go through it. You see a bird or you hear a bird. Both, both are an observation of some kind, okay? we look at shape and size. And again, most birds in a family share similar shapes and sizes, right? There's always gonna be exceptions, but generally it is true, okay? And if you have a hard copy field guide, there are family plates within your field guide where you flip it open, all right? And you can see all of these diurnal raptors are, are put together Okay, so if you can narrow it down to family by shape and size, you already have a great, a great starting point. And again, if you tab your field guide where all those families are, boom, you have sped up your identification process. Go you, okay? So shape and size, then look for field marks, all right? Um, and again, that requires learning those field marks, learning where you should be looking, what, you know, what areas can show certain things, you know, sparrows with their streaking and their breast spots or, you know, what, uh, what their mailer region looks like. That's important for sparrows, whereas maybe it's not for other birds, okay? Learn the field marks that are important for each of those families, okay? Um, and just learn the general terminology for them as well. Then we get into some context. What behavior is it exhibiting, okay? Again, this is it's context, but it's also part of the visible. You can see it, and then what is it doing while you see it, okay? So as you're taking in shape and size and field marks, also take in things like behavior. Listen for it, okay? Is it calling? Is it pecking? What's it doing, all right? Listen for it, take in the audible, and then consider your habitat and your location. And not just your location as in your GPS coordinates, your location within the habitat, okay? Is the bird up at the top of the tree or is it feeding on the ground? Is it on the side of the tree? Is it in the bushes? Location within habitat is just as critical as location of yourself, okay, and where the observation's happening. That's a lot to remember. So I recommend you get a field book, a little field notebook. Um, if you don't have a great memory, writing things down is a great way then to revisit for an identification later, okay? Which leads to number two, take notes and or sketch. If you're an artist, all right, if you have an artistic quality, use it. Draw what you saw, okay? Use those abilities, use your gifts, 
don't fight them. If you're not a, a write down notes person, then draw it, okay? If you have a camera, photograph it. Also, phones now can record sound. So if you hear a sound and you wanna, you wanna come back and revisit it for identification later, use your voice recorder from your smartphone, capture it, record it, okay, and visit it later. But the very first thing you should not do, you should not get your binoculars out. Oh, there's a bird. Oh, oh I see a bird. Field guide. Because ah! that's what you'll do. You'll scream as you flip through pages, and guess what the bird did while you were doing that? It flew away. It's gone. Just like that. Okay? Don't go to your field guide first. Get all of the information you can, then go to your field guide. All right? You really, you'll just, you'll just sit here doing this. Well, no, 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 no. And the bird's gone. And you can't get any more information. Capture the information, especially if it's a new bird to you. Get as much information as possible then go to your guide, okay? Or your app or whatever you're using, but don't see the bird and then quickly go to your field guide because it just never ends well. Never ends well at all, okay? All right. Web, all right? This is just a reminder. I'm not gonna go back through all this. A reminder, use your basics web. What's visible? What's audible? What's my context, okay? And stair step up to bird identification glory, which is, you know, identifying exhibitors by silhouettes. That's, that's bird identification glory. When you can identify exhibitors by silhouettes, you're there, my friend. You have got it. Okay. Um, an important part is learning your field guide. Okay. And we're just about to our Q&A &A session here. So hold on for just another minute and then we'll get to our Q&A. Um, learn it. Read the introduction. The first thing people do when they buy their field guide, just flip open to all the pretty plates. Don't do it. Read the first part. It teaches you how to use your field guide. Also, learn how your field guide is organized. I gave you a little cheat code of, of you know, using common bird sizes, larger than a crow, typically at the front, crow to robins, typically in the middle, robin to sparrow size, or smaller, typically at the back, okay? That's a cheat. It won't always work. So learn how your book is organized. In most cases, they're organized taxonomically, which means you need to learn where the bird families are in your book, okay? It also helps just speed up your identification process. Um, and again, tab to family so that you can quickly open up to raptors or, or hummingbirds or waterfowl, okay, whatever. Use tricks, use these little things to help you, okay? All right, so learn your field guide and definitely don't open it first thing, uh, you know, when you see a bird. Don't see a bird and then open your field guide. Because I'll, I'll come out of this computer and I'll, I'll yell at you. I'll do it. I'll, I'll yell at you in the nicest way you could imagine, but I'll do it. I'll do it, okay? All right, so two birds here. We're gonna do this and then we're gonna go to questions, okay? So two birds here. They share some similar-ish coloration and field marks, okay? So what I want you to do is there at your, at your own computer, um, as you're watching this, either write down or just, you know, verbally aloud, say some differences between these birds, okay? Just say them out loud or write them down because we're going we're gonna to identify them, okay? But there are some superficial things about them that some people might say, well, that looks, uh, these look kind of like the same bird, you know, is one a juvenile and is one not. No, these are two separate species, okay? Um, and there are several little things we can use to identify them, okay? So even though superficially they share some characteristics, there's easy ways to separate them, okay? And these aren't two that necessarily give a lot of people trouble, but when you're first starting, you want to learn some of the easier birds first, because um, it just helps to build that confidence and keep that identification train a chugging, okay? So, both these birds, they have a white crown stripe down the middle, so that median crown stripe is white. Then they each have a black adjacent crown stripe, okay? But that's where some of the similarities kind of stop. You look at the bird uh, on my right there, it's got 
a bright yellow lower spot, which is kind of the front part of that, uh, that supercilium, right, which is that eyebrow area. You can see bright yellow. The other bird doesn't have that, all right? One of them has a bright white throat. Again, the other bird kind of a grayish throat. Look at the bill color. One bird has a bright orange bill. The other bird has a gray bill, okay? So there are things that we could be picking up out of both of these for identification. Now, this is all visible. Um, if we try to pull some context from these, it's a little bit harder. There's, there's, not, there's not a lot of context to pull from them, but hey, that's maybe okay in this case because we have enough visible to work through to our identification, okay? And this just zooms in a little bit so you can see some of those, those features in the face area especially, okay? Superficially, they can be similar, but these are an obvious pair of birds that while they share some field marks that are kind of similar, there's very obvious things that are different. And that's all I want you to do is I wanted you to write down what is different, okay? Write down what is different so you can see these obvious differences, all right? Um, you're gonna see birds at your feeders where males and females look very different, okay? Like house finches, all right? One's a male, one's a female. So you have to take into consideration those things as well, okay? These are both the same species of bird, but they're very different um, in their appearance, okay? So sometimes it's not a species to species thing. Sometimes it's a male to female, okay? Very different looks, all right? Okay, um, so I'm going to switch now and we're gonna do our Q and A. Um, and so we probably have some, some questions that uh, maybe were asked in, in the chat. And uh, so I'm gonna get those and we're gonna do some, some Q&A. So if you still have questions, make sure to throw them in the chat. Um, uh oh, let's see here, get control. Okay. <clears throat> All right, hold that there, let's put that there. Okay, all right, and Miss Julie's coming in and she's going to read some, uh, some select questions um, out and, uh, and then I will answer them. Hey, Zach, um, you've given us a great presentation and some great information on bird identification and your bird calls are fantastic. This has been a lot of fun. Um, right now, we haven't had any chats come through, um, any questions come through our chat actually, and so I'm wondering if since we have a couple of minutes left, if, if we don't have any bird identification questions, if um, you might wanna wrap up today by telling us maybe one of your favorite birding stories. Okay, now I, I, have, a, I have a bunch of messages in the chat. Are you not seeing those? No, I, I don't. Okay, that's all right. You know what, then I'll just grab them. I will, uh, I'm gonna stop my screen share then. Oh, good, okay, I will, and, I'll see all right. you out. I will pull these up. Okay, let me grab some of these. Okay, so someone from Denver is asking about uh, more birds present this spring than other years. You know, migration is a, is a tricky thing. It depends on, on uh, weather patterns. Um, it depends on, you know, uh, cyclical patterns within birds. So, you know, if you're seeing more of a certain type of bird, it's very possible that that species, you know, maybe it had a, a productive year, you know, the year before. Um, almost all bird species do show some cyclical pattern in, in, uh, in their population. So it's a, it's a big question to answer. Uh, so I, I can't give you a definitive one on, you know, are you seeing more birds? Well, if you're seeing more birds, it's hard for me to argue against you, right? Um, okay, uh, let's see here. <laughs> uh, someone asking about, uh, haven't seen any blue jays coming by their bird feeder. Um, you know, a great food for attracting blue jays are, are peanuts, unsalted, never use salted foods for birds. Um, peanuts, black hole sunflower seed, great, uh, great for birds, okay, uh, for attracting birds. Um, all right, uh, let's see, we got uh, someone asking about, oh, they were guessing, guessing what bird was in the grass. Good, good, good. What is a good field camera? Okay, yeah, so, Phones are hard, but there is, there is a trick, all right? If you don't want to get a, a full-on camera, take your binoculars, take your camera phone, and you can actually, it's called 
digibinning or digiscoping, depending on what you're using. You can actually take a picture through your binoculars. And I have had some, some rare birds that uh, I got shots that you could identify the bird with that method. It's not perfect. It's not award winning. But sometimes if you just need to identify a bird, you know, that's great. Um, there are super zoom style cameras um, like the Nikon P900, I think it's called where it's got uh, an equivalent lens of like 600 millimeters, um, you know, that you would have on a big professional camera, but it's captured in a compact camera. They're, they're generally more affordable. They're a great field camera. They're not heavy. Um, and again, I, I'm not necessarily recommending that one over any other. It's just one I can think of off the top of my head. Look into super zoom style cameras. They're point and shoot with super zooms, okay? Um, <laughs> someone asked me to do more bird sounds. I'm gonna spare you more bird sounds. Um, Okay, so what are some of the major bird families that you should be familiar with, especially in the Denver and Rocky Mountain area? You know, in, in the Rocky Mountains, we, we, have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of waterfowl that migrate through, so know your waterfowl. The Rockies are great for raptors, so, you know, be good about learning your raptors. Um, you know, in, the, in the, the Rockies there around Denver, you know, learning your hummingbirds, you can see during parts of migration up to four or five species of hummingbird, um, finches, Finches and swallows are, are both uh, families that, that you'll see a lot of diversity in in our region. So make sure you have a good grasp of your finches and swallows. And then of course your warblers and sparrows, which I just listed a lot of different families, but we see a lot of these families in the Rockies. And this year along the front range, it was a banner year for Eastern warblers showing up. Blackburnian warblers, magnolia warblers, um, worm-eating warblers, um, there was a, a Louisiana water thrush. I mean, just crazy birds that don't normally come up on the front range. But this year, either there were more people out enjoying birds, which is a great thing, especially if you're doing it safely. Um, and, and, you know, there could have been some, some distinct weather patterns that were helping to push some of those eastern birds in. Um, uh, okay, so this one this is a great one. The smaller field guides. So this is, this is the large version of Sibley. The smaller versions, which are Sibley East and Sibley West, um, they're, they're kind of separated by the Rockies. If you're right in the foothills of the Rockies, which is, you know, kind of the Denver area, is the Eastern ones still appropriate or are there better ones for our area? The nice thing about those, those smaller ones that are separated um, is they still allow for some of that overlap. However, if you're in Colorado, Wyoming, or Utah, I recommend Sibley West. Um, if you want a pocket-sized field guide, um, if you get the full size, it covers everything, right? But if you want a pocket size one, Sibley West is what I recommend for our region because the few Eastern species that, that we do get usually are still covered by Sibley West, okay? Um, it's, a, it's a smaller version. Um, oh, we got, uh, what's your best birding story? Maybe, maybe I'll come back to that one. Um, let's see. Is it true that the male is always the more colorful bird? Great question. So, no. Uh, a species that we see a lot of in the arid west, the Wilson's phalarope and, and other phalaropes as well. The female is actually this beautifully plumaged bird and the male's pretty dull. Um, and the male actually, the female will lay eggs in the nest and the male will care for the nest, uh, incubate the eggs and raise the chicks, okay? Um, so it's, it's reverse in phalaropes, it's, it's pretty cool. So if you see a more colorful phalarope with a much duller one, the female is the duller one. Birds are cool, birds are so cool. Um, let's see here. Uh, I'll do one more question, then I'll tell you my best bird story, and then we'll call it a day because I'm about to lose my voice. Um, more sessions like this in the future. Yes, we'll be doing more of these in the future. Um, so make sure to, to you know like us on Facebook uh, so that you know when these announcements come out, you can get them. Um, register you know for our newsletter and stuff so that you can get notifications of uh, webinars and things like this. Um, Let's see, I don't see any other, oh, all right, last one. What is the best time of day for birding? Morning. Typically, at least once it starts to warm up, so spring through fall, morning time is the best time to go birding, okay? Um, especially right now, the dawn chorus is, is when all of the, the singing birds, um, they start singing before the sun is even up, okay? And it's a wonderful time to get out and experience it. Usually there's less people, okay? Um, cooler temperatures and the birds are active as the insects especially are starting to get active and they're starting to defend their territories for the beginning of the day. The birds are active and uh, it's a great time to go out. 
Okay. All right. Um, best birding story, and then we'll call it good because I'm already a little bit over. So uh, I was doing the Great Texas Birding Classic several years ago with a pair of friends, um, which is a, it's a birding competition in Texas. And to count the bird, you need at least two members of your party to see the bird. So I'm driving um, and I see a gray hawk fly over. And it wasn't a bird we had for our count yet. I see a gray hawk fly over and I didn't want to lose sight of it. I had to keep visual sight of it so that I could tell my, my teammates where to look. Well, the only way to keep sight of it was to leave the vehicle and I was driving and I did not put it in park. I opened the door and I jumped out and I ran after the bird, binoculars in hand, screaming, Greyhawk, Greyhawk, Greyhawk! Hoping they would keep up, um, but I forgot to hit the brakes, put the vehicle in park, and they were rolling down the road in a runaway vehicle as I was chasing a Greyhawk. And that, uh, that's one of my favorite stories because no one got hurt, right? It was a terribly, terribly unsafe decision. Don't ever do that, but that uh, that's one of the funnier ones again, because nobody got hurt. Right. So it's always uh, works out well when no one gets hurt. Okay. All right. Well, everyone, thank you so much. Um, and make sure to yeah follow us so that uh, when we do these again, you can be invited to them. Thank you all so much. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, go enjoy some birds now. Okay. We still got daylight left. Take care. <laughs>